Hi everyone and thank you for joining us here in podcast land for another edition of my sailing podcast. I hope wherever you may be around the world you're keeping well in good spirits and if sailing's what you're into I hope you're getting some time out on the water. Since our last edition it seems the winds haven't stopped blowing here in Cowes. There's been some grim weather but for the most part it's been sunny, windy and there's been a lot of sailing going on in my household. It's been a good month out on the water. Before we get things rolling, a big thanks to those of you listening that have taken the time to get in touch. It's great to hear what you think. Many of you loved the conversation with Ben Ainsley, so many thanks for that. If you like what you're hearing, do please give us a like and even leave a comment. And of course, let all your friends know what a great time you had tuning in. And I know I say it every month, but it all helps here in podcast land. This month, we've a very special guest on the podcast, a man I've known for a very long time, but also a man whose name transcends the world of sailing. Throughout my youth, he was up there as one of the sport's real icons. He has enjoyed a truly remarkable career that has spanned more than my lifetime. And now just into his 80s, he still shows no sign of slowing down in any way, as you'll hear. I am, of course, talking about the legendary William Robert Patrick Knox Johnston, better known to the world, of course, as Sir Robin. I know many of you will be more than familiar with Robin's feats on the water, but I know that for some, especially some of our younger listeners, Robin's story may not be so well known. Before we get started then, it's important to remember the context of Robin's first major sailing achievement. Throughout the 1960s, the two global superpowers of the United States and the then Soviet Union were firmly locked in what we now call the space race. Initially, the race to leave Earth's atmosphere, but ultimately, what was then thought the greatest prize, the race to the moon. As a sailor, it has always seemed remarkable to me that by the time man was about to think about plotting to leave our home planet and engaging in all the cutting edge industry and technology that that feat would require, no individual had ever managed to sail solo non-stop around the world. The two feats are of course very different. But while NASA and the might of the American space program were developing the Apollo space missions, traditional boat builders in India started work on a wooden frame of teak that would become Sir Robin's 32-foot catch, Suheli. Throughout the second half of the 1960s, Sir Robin planned and prepared, and on the 14th of June 1968, Suheli slipped her dock in Falmouth, England, and headed for the horizon. For Sir Robin, navigation would be via charts, compass, barometer, sextant and chronometer. And when he left port, Suheli was stocked for 300 days at sea. And he was leaving to attempt a voyage no other human had ever managed. In part one of this podcast, we talk about the build-up to that groundbreaking voyage. We discuss the wonderful Suheli and how she fared for hundreds of days at sea and we talk in depth of the voyage itself. While Robin had been plotting his journey, the Times newspaper had instigated the Golden Globe race, so Robin was not the only man attempting the voyage. But 312 days later, he sailed Suheli back into Falmouth to become the first person ever to complete the solo non-stop circumnavigation. We talked to Robin at Portsmouth Sailing Club, who were very generous with their lovely club, just around the corner from Robin's home. So a big, big thank you to them. I hope you enjoy the time I spend with Sir Robin Knox Johnston.
That really is one thing to be done now, and that's to go out around without stopping. I thought 300 days was quite possible, and I took enough food for 300 days plus 10%. The relief of getting to the start line is that you've gone through the difficult bit. Thanks for joining us on the podcast, Robin. It's great to have you along. We've got so much to talk about, but I've been wondering, are you a podcast listener at all? Sherry, I don't get much time. You know, this last three months, I thought, great, I'm going to find out what it's like to retire. I've never been so busy. I'm not looking forward to retirement now. I think I'll stay working. It's, it's less hard work. I'd imagined you, Robin, you know, varnishing the teak, uh, listening to the podcast. Uh, varnishing the teak I've been doing, yes, but uh, no, I've... Uh, no, no, I haven't listened to the podcast, actually. Well, we'll convert you at some time. <laughs> uh, we're recording this podcast in Portsmouth, Robin, just by your home. The Portsmouth Sailing Club have very kindly lent us some space, so many thanks to the club here. To put it in context, the country is slowly coming out of lockdown. But for you, Robin, you had a fleet of boats halfway around the world, didn't you? The Clipper fleet were in the Philippines and you had to take what is now, with a few months of hindsight, the very obvious decision to postpone racing. How hard was that decision for you? Well, it's never easy because there's, it's not just disrupting the cruise, uh, there's financial implications of it too. And so I think it took us, we started considering it on the Friday, by Monday, we knew we had to break it up. Uh, it was so much was happening that particular weekend. It would be about the 14th or so of March. No, 11th, 12th, maybe. And we just saw what was going on. Suddenly, Korea has got an outbreak. Um, Taiwan can't go there. Hong Kong started an outbreak, although they controlled it very quickly there. Um, but then we start hearing it's happened in America. That's our next stop. Okay, we'll be clear. We'll have been at sea four or five weeks. But can we fly into America? Uh, we're not sure. And we looked at what was going on there. Said, we won't be able to get there. And crews won't be able to fly out. We can't go on. We've got to, we've got to stop right here. So, you, frankly, the decision was made for us. I mean, you've just got to accept. Look, guys, here's the facts. There's an obvious conclusion. We've got to stop the race. So, actually, we spent the next few days, well, the team did particularly well, getting everyone flights out. And um, we left the boats there, and left a chap looking after them, um, brought everyone back, and most were in furlough, so, so it's all we can do, really. So what's the plan? You managed to get all the crews back to their relevant homes, and the race will restart then, avoiding the worst of the Southern Hemisphere weather later in the year, with a big impact, I guess, on the next race too. Right, well, the next race had to be put off a year, um, because... We can't, you've got certain critical points, like for instance, Caribbean. You don't want to be in the Caribbean after the beginning of June because of the hurricane season. Um, you don't really want to cross the North, North Pacific, which is as bad as the Southern Ocean, too early. <clears throat> but then you've got to tie that in with getting through Panama and into the Caribbean. So we looked at it and said, well, actually, the best thing we can do is restart in a year's time and hope that in that time, they found a vaccine, or this thing sort of petered out. So I think all we can do is say, this is what we're planning. You know, everyone's, um, our whole team, they're all on furlough, most of them are on furlough at the moment, um, all aware that we're going to restart next February with any luck. And we'll get out there a bit early and start, you know, rechecks checks and all the usual things, clean the hulls, but, um, and then get the crews in, do some um, sailing for them just to revise, make sure their minds are back on sailing check they can still do their bowlings. And um, then we'll sail from Subi to Sanya and then up the Chinese coast and across Seattle, assuming we can. But, you know, you have to be positive about this and say, well, it's, it's eight months away. You know, th things are moving. I know it's still going up in the States, but it's going to get through. New York's now going down. So, you know, I think you have to say it does that and then it comes down. Just hope it goes away. Well, we'll chat a lot more about the Clipper race a bit later on, Robin. But before that, there's so much to talk to you about. You spent much of your life at sea, but spent early life in various spots, finding a love of boats at an early age up near Chester and the Dee estuary. 
What were your very early sailing adventures? Well, my first venture was um, I was four and I decided to make a raft. I wanted to get a float and I got hold of an old orange box and I nailed it together, slatted it together and I carried it all the way down to the D, it wasn't that far, launched it and stood on it and it sank. Well, that was an early introduction to Archimedes' principle, uh, which has served me in good stead ever since. But then we moved from there down to London and the London suburbs, Beckenham, there isn't a lot of water around there. And at the age of eight, I started saving up for a dinghy, which was 15 pounds, a little clinker built dinghy. This is 19, late 1940s. And for three years, I saved every penny that came my way. And by the time I was 11, I got 15 pounds. And I looked up to buy it, and it was now 21 pounds. So I never got my dinghy. So then I went away to school and stayed with my grandparents. Um, and I built a canoe in their loft to my, entirely to my own design. Amazing, it floated, um, covered in canvas, launched it on the Grand Union Canal and sank it. But that was because I hadn't put a deck on it yet. And I got a lot of fun out of that canoe. Um, I you know, used to go on holiday with me down to Selsey and I'd go paddling everywhere. And I, I, what I loved about it was I'm on my own and I'm the freedom. I can paddle where I like. And places like Pagan Bay are beautiful places. You know, it's a bird sanctuary now. But it always was very empty and it's lots of mud and little creeks and things. To, you can, you can uh, go in a canoe. So I had that and then school got a bit more serious and... Um, because when I was 17, I joined the Merchant Navy. We had to learn to sail in those days because in the event of the ship sinking, you sailed your lifeboat. But my company took all the crew off one ship and put 39 uh, cadet officers on board. So we had a whaler, and then they gave us two dinghies. And one of those dinghies was mine. And God help anyone else who took it out. You know, and I was nasty when I'm crossed. So that became recognised as my dinghy. And I had my particular crew who claims that I capsized him in every port east of Suez. And I think I'd be guilty of perjury if I denied it. <laughs> it's funny that you mention you, you're, you know, you're, you're not a good person when you're cross, Robin, because I read somewhere that one of your ancestors was the last pirate hung on the west coast of Scotland. And this may be heavily biased, but um, obviously I've only ever known you as a real seafarer. But from an early day, was a life at sea inevitable for a young Robin Knox Johnson? I started about the age of eight. And from really from that point on, it was going to be boats one way or the other. And I think joining the Merchant Navy was one of my better decisions in life. Um, because you don't have the protection that you get in, say, the Royal Navy. You're much more on your own. And you really had to scrap for your corner. I was quite small. I was only about five foot eight. But I was a boxer and a good one. And so they very quickly left me alone because I'd fight back. And that made life so much easier. And a year later, of course, I'm over six feet. So I had um, two and a half years on the cadet ship. Learned so much. It was wonderful training. And then I had a year basically on Eastern service. Joined a ship going from Persian Gulf to Japan came back and took my second mate's ticket and went out east again because it was 20% more pay and no tax. Well, this sounded good. I, like, I want money for a boat at some stage, so I'm going to start saving up. Also, I was saving up to get married. I'm not sure which is the more expensive, marriage or a boat. It's a pretty close call, that. As you said, Robin, as a young man, you know, you were in the Merchant Navy. But was there a say by the 1960s, was there a means for competitive sailing? I mean, obviously nowhere near like there is now, but what was that landscape like? What you could do out there, um, the company so well established, you know, you could go to the Royal Bombay or the Karachi Yacht Club and just say, anyone want crew? And I was waiting for a ship once in Madras and uh, I just go down to the Yacht Club and take a beverage out all day, just give me a Tyndall, uh, an Indian seaman. Um, and out we go for the day, and I go sailing all up and outside the harbour, and I was having a great time. Racing was more, not so much at Bombay Karachi, there was very keen racing there. Um, trying to remember the boats they had. They weren't seabirds, 
water wags, I think. But there was good racing there. And this is when you start honing your skills, isn't it? You're sitting in a dinghy with someone who actually knows how to sail a dinghy. And he's telling you things, and you're beginning to play with the sails more than you can see on a lifeboat, which is pretty rudimentary. And you're suddenly like, oh, yeah, okay. So if I do that, yeah, I see, okay. So you're starting to get a little bit better all the time. You're learning all the time. As you say, you're in India for work and with some pals hatched plans to build a boat and sail her back to England. And the end result was, of course, the wonderful Suheli, built from Indian teak, from designs you'd bought via post, no internet, of course. Uh, we'll talk a lot more about her as we go, but just give us a little idea, Robin, of how Suheli came to be. With three of us, I was by then second officer and two third officers. One had been on cadetship with me. And we were on the same ship. We started talking about, you know, we, we narrowly missed a Dow one night between Muscat and Karachi. And of course, they don't have lights, but we saw it flickering light. We managed to dodge it and we just started talking. And I was doing the 12 to 4 and he was doing 8 to 12. So we used to meet at midnight um, and we'd chat for a bit. And then slowly the idea developed, well, you know, end of a contract is buy a Dow and sail it home. So I wrote to Alan Villiers, um, I'd never met. And so out of the blue, he gets a letter from his unknown second officer saying, what do you think about this idea? He wrote me a three page letter back saying, basically, don't do it because you'll never sell the boat. And he said, I suspect you won't have any more money <laughs> once you built it. And he'd done a trip on that. I spent a year on one, Sons of Sinbad, brilliant book. So we took his advice, uh, looked around for boats, looked around for places to build boats. And the choices were Karachi, Bombay or Hong Kong but we needed plans. So we wrote to Fermin Pool for some plans and they sent the wrong ones, not the ones we'd ordered, but then we looked at and thought, a seaworthy, doesn't look very different to a lifeboat in many ways. Well, look, we're running short of time, let's build this one. So that's really how Suheli started. And then we've got quotes. And Bombay won really because the price is about the same as Karachi, but we were based there. So we're in Bombay one week in four. And if I wasn't there, Peter was. Um, and so we could actually keep an eye on the build and, and go and work on it ourselves. So that's why she came to be built in Bombay. Well, as is often the case, Robin, life gets in the way of things. It took three years before you could finally sail Suheli into Gravesend, down the River Thames, of course. That was early 1967, and it was around that time that there was talk of a big transatlantic race. What was going on in offshore sailing at that time? I think, well, I think you've got to differentiate between offshore sailing and ocean sailing because I often pull David Asher's leg about the fact he was Commodore of the Royal Ocean Racing Club and they never crossed oceans. In fact, the first time he crossed an ocean was with me. Uh, but what was happening in my sort of sailing, which is long distance, 1960, we had the first uh, OSTAR, Observer's Single-Handed Transatlantic Race, won by Francis Chichester. 64, it was held again, four-year cycle, and Eric Tarbley won it. 68, Geoffrey Williams won it. But by that time, Chichester had gone around the world. And I was in Durban. We missed the Cape, and so we all took jobs. I was captain of a ship down there, running up the coast. And I had the same radio from Marconi as, as Chichester, so we tried to make contact and never managed it. In fact, I never met him until I got back from around the world. But I was very impressed by his voyage. You know, that uh, non-stop to Australia was by that time the longest voyage ever made in a yacht. And I thought, wow, that really is one thing to be done now. And that's to go around without stopping. And the idea just grew on me. And so I spent 67, I was first officer on the Kenya liner, writing to 52 companies to try and get money for it. And I basically needed about £5,000. Um, 2000 for the boat, which Colin Moody had designed for me, 56 feet. So I got the length of speed and size, which helps. Um, and of course, I'm at sea, so it's rather hard to follow up. Anyway, they all wrote back and said no anyway. So um, it wasn't a total disaster because Tenants Lager gave me 120 cans and Cadbury's gave me a £5 voucher. So that was the extent of my, my sponsorship. Um, although the Cruising Club of America didn't give me their Blue Water Medal because they said I'd been sponsored. And I said, would you like to tell me who it was and I'll send them an invoice. 
he got round to it in the end. But you know, it was a different world in sailing then. I mean, uh, sponsorship was rather frowned on. Poor Chichester put up with quite a lot because he had the wool mark on his boat. Oh, you can't do that, old boy. It's not allowed. Until Claire Francis got sponsored, and then that was all right. But that was a few years later. The world was slowly changing. And uh, so getting a sponsorship, I, I didn't, couldn't get it. So what I did is I signed four contracts, two for books, one here in the States, and a magazine in the States, and with a newspaper. And I got the advances, and that gave me the money to buy the food and the set of sails I needed. I got the boat anyway, you know, renew a rigging, do a few other little jobs. And that's how I got enough money. And so as I passed certain points in the world, they paid more. So financially, I sailed myself into solvency. I mean, it was such an exciting time. And it was all, suddenly, it was all also a bit cloak and dagger, wasn't it? Various people lining up to make attempts on the solo non-stop circumnavigation. And Rob Knox Johnston, with a 32-foot Suheili, determined not to let the French sailors get there first. Yes, it's a bit unfair on the French. I was determined not to let anyone get there first except me, to be honest. Uh, I was aware of some of the others. When the race was announced on the 17th of March, 68, I was actually serving on a frigate. I hadn't entered, but it was announced I was in it. I never did enter, but I must have been in the race because he gave me the prize. But um, there were four of us at that time. Uh, Bill King, myself, I think Caruzzo, I'm not sure. Now I heard whispers about Che, Blythe and John Ridgway. Uh, John in particular, Che was keeping it very quiet. That's really how they fell out. Um, and then other people started coming along, people like Bernard Matessier and such and that. And I looked at everyone. And I said, there's only one chap here who's got as much experience as me, and that's Matessier. He's got a bigger boat, he'll go faster. The rest of them, well, who knows? I certainly won't be the fastest, but if I can just keep plodding along, perhaps they'll all fall out, which is, I thought, well, probably they won't all fall out, but anyway, I'll plod anyway. <laughs> And so that was basically my plan, sail as best I could. When do you remember first hearing about the Golden Globe Challenge? And how did you set about getting ready? Well, that was, Golden Globe came in March 68. I'd started planning July the previous year. Um, I was going to go then. And the more I thought about it, the more I was going. And that was it. Um, so that's when I first heard about it. The initial rules weren't that clever. And they appointed Francis Chichester as chairman, but he was in New Zealand and he couldn't change the rules by then, which he knew to be not very sensible. So we had to serve with the rules. But then they said, well, we're going to start the race on the 31st of October. Will you be ready? I said, I expect to be south of Cape Town by then. They said, oh, you won't be able to be in our race. I said, you're catching on fast. I was like, you idiot, haven't you studied this? Don't you realise you're going to go around Cape Horn in midsummer if you've any sense? If we leave this country at the end of October, I'm going to be going around Cape Horn at the end of autumn. That is not a good time to, thing to do. But this was a newspaper. They know everything. You know, Chichester wasn't there to guide them. And so, anyway, they had to change the rules. So they, I wasn't the only one who said that. Actually, Che did and so did John. So they changed the rules and said, OK, you can start any time between the 1st of June and the 31st of October. But that threw their ideas of a race, because we're all going to set off at different times. So then they had the trophy for the first person to get home and do it. And then they had the money for the person who did it fastest in that time. But that only came out after we said that we're going early. You know, forget it. I'm not going to risk my life just for your headlines. In your excellent book about the time. I mean, it's really wonderful. There's a full manifest of everything that you took, food, charts, provisions, but you mentioned the 300 day estimate. I mean, obviously back then, no one had done it. No one knew it would be even possible. Did you think 300 days was a, a viable figure? Yes, I did, Shirley, because uh, when I sailed Suheni back from Cape Town to London, in 66, 67. That was 
extremely good training for it because I got a very good idea of the sort of average speed I'd get out of it. More than that, with three of us, it gave me a very good idea of what provisions I might need. Uh, we took 77 days, in fact. But, you know, three of us, okay, just multiply that up. So I thought 300 days was quite possible. And that was a line for slowing down in the doldrums and that sort of thing. And I took f enough food for 300 days plus 10%. And that was my reserve. And actual fact, I was back in 312 days, but I still probably had enough food left for a month. So I'd have been all right for food. Um, but I, I don't think people grasp the fact, actually, I was quite an experienced ocean sailor by then. You know, I'd done over 20,000 miles. And that's a lot in ocean sailing experience at that time. How did you feel when you thought about that long, about 300 days all alone? Hardship and life on board, I'm sure you were looking forward to that. But the whole thing, being all alone for that long, was that a worry at all? Do you know, I never even thought about it. I was so fixated on doing this. So it's single-handed, so I'm going to be alone. OK, let's get on with it. I remember Jeremy was saying to me, um, how are you going to manage on your own? I said, don't know. He said, well, well, I mean, have you done anything? I said, look, if I'm back in two weeks, I'm not managing. Otherwise, I'm going, all right? I mean, there's a lovely phrase um, you've written about Sue Haley, that she has a habit of turning spectators into helpers. I mean, you had a lot of help, didn't you, for the voyage? It seems you thought of everything. I remember being appalled at reading how you had to peel labels of one and a half thousand tins of food, and then colour code them to know their contents and varnish them before stowing them away. I mean, provisions weren't available like they are today. How big a task was just getting to the start line? I think anyone will tell you the, you know, the relief of getting to the start line is actually you've gone through the difficult bit. The difficult bit is getting your boat, getting your sponsor if you need one, uh, working out exactly what you need, all the planning, preparation, food is just one aspect of it. You know, you just sit there thinking, what if that breaks? What's my backup? Okay, I better take a spare. And so you go through everything and you keep going through it in your mind. You, you're walking around a ship, you're on your boat, you're thinking, ah, oh, if that breaks, I better do something about it. Because I had Sue Haley down here in Portsmouth when I was on the frigate. I'd work on it when we were in, in port. And so I've got plenty of time to think about it. And I, all my store lists were printed on the bridge wireless office typewriter because I was the communications officer. So I was writing out all these lists, getting prices for things, trying to do all this while also being a, a watch keeper on a frigate and running a division, which was great. Uh, but it was, um, I did have that time to think about it and I had, I think the point that people forget is I got a lot of experience to draw on. So I was probably luckier than most, in fact. Uh, and I got battery acid in my eye and for a week I couldn't see that it. Of the nine who started, there were only four of us left. Sue Haley? Sue Haley? Is that you, Sue Haley? I was one of the 12 who knew the truth. And so, June the 14th, 1968, Robin Knox Johnson and Sue Haley left Falmouth, waving farewell to a small fleet of well-wishers, and you were alone. And modern solo sailors always say how that moment is always such a relief, getting away from all the noise to finally do the job. But you were heading off, to some degree, into the unknown. How did you feel on that day? I think, uh, I think we all feel the same. You know, I'm away now. Right, let's get this boat ready. Let's get sorted out. I've got a few hours before darkness. Um, can I get a bearing, make sure I've got a fix um, so I know where I'm starting off from? And, um, you know, you're just getting on with it. It's The time has come. You, you can sit around. I think yacht club bars are full of people who were going to do something, and it's always someone else's fault, you know. When you left, what was the actual race scenario at that time? I mean, there was a couple of competitors ahead of you and there was a window of several months for departures. And in those early days, with so much sailing ahead, how much did you pay attention to the other competitors? Well, the problem was communications in those days because all you had was a single sideband radio. 
And of course, charging the batteries to use it um, meant I had to put my generator up on deck and, and put away with it. So I lost the engine fairly early on. It seized up. So I had an arrangement. I called up once a week on a Thursday and would give a story to the chap writing for the Sunday Mirror, who's still a friend of mine. And he would fill me in with what was going on. And, you know, for the first month, I wasn't sailing very fast anyway because I had a bit of jaundice. So I was just taking life easy, letting my body recover because I'd had it before. And, you know, I just got myself settled and I got moving and I started cracking along. And um, then I got into the trades and began to really move. And, you know, the trades are lovely. I mean, ah, oh, it's a glorious thing. And I remember the Sunday Times saying, if I was where I thought I was, my father rang them up and said, my son's a master mariner. If he thinks he's there, he's there. Oh, well, you know, we are, how do we know? And I said, of course, it's journalists again, know everything. They don't. And uh, you know, I, was, I never lied about my positions at all. And I always gave accurate ones. The only time I've lied about my positions was in the first Cape Rio race when I was up against Tarbley for the first time. And I sort of kept 50 miles in the bank just so people didn't think, realise I got some bloody good wind and was going flat out. Mind game. That was the first time Peter Blake sailed with me. We'll get to Peter Blake a, a little bit later. Those early days on board, Robin, I mean, the first couple of months, there are so many anecdotes in your book. Diving in to repair the hull, swimming to keep active, many instances involving a drop of whiskey and Gilbert and Sullivan sing-alongs. But all the while, you were heading south, of course. How worried were you as the southern latitudes approached? Well, probably unlike most except Matessier, I'd actually been there, but on a big ship, a seven and a half thousand tonner, well, and 18,000 tonner. So I did have some idea of what it was like. Problem we had then, surely, was, was very little literature. You know, who'd written a book about the Southern Ocean? The Smeatons, who'd been pitch pulled. Chichester's book wasn't out. Uh, Rose hadn't even got back when I left. So there was n nothing you could read up except the Admiralty Manuals. Well, I was used to the Admiralty Manuals. I mean, they're your Bibles at sea. So I read them up and said, OK, we can get big waves down here. Well, well, just going to have to do, do, deal with them as I can. You know, but I've got a, a well-found boat in nice shape. Let's see how I can manage it down there. And I learned a lot from my first few gales. I learned a lot about the boat, how to handle her in big seas. Things that are still relevant to people today, actually. And she's a small boat for a big ocean. She is a very small boat, um, 32 feet. But she's a cracking little sea boat. I mean, a wave could wash right over and did on a few occasions. Um, ah, she'd just shake herself and bob up. Like a terrier, really. Once in the South, Robin, things began to get trickier, didn't they? I mean, multiple times you mentioned how tough, how frustrating it was to always... I mean, for us, it's really hard to visualise, way more so when you think of the technology at your disposal. No forecast, no Gore-Tex, no fancy cooking stove. I mean, very limited communications. It's incredible to think you sailed past the Cape Verdes in the Atlantic and the next land you saw was Australia. How hard was life in the Southern Ocean? Actually, I mean, I was quite enjoying it. Um, the problem was things were breaking. And, you know, the cabin top got smashed over. I mean, we got knocked over. And it moved the cabin top. And I bolted it. I had some bolts and I bolted it on, making sure I didn't lose it, because otherwise large empty space in the middle of the hull. They're not going to last long down there. Um, so I built it back, but water dripped onto the radio, so I lost it. Um, I eventually found the cause, but months and months later. Uh, so I, I lost my ability to transmit. I could receive, but I couldn't transmit. So from that moment, just beyond south of Cape of Good Hope, no one actually knew where I was. Then self-steering got damaged and then I lost my water tank so I'd lost all my fresh water 
Uh, and then I got battery acid in my eye, and uh, you know, for a week I couldn't see for it. And um, and then I got my first really big s storm, and I did what I'd done on the previous trip in the Atlantic when we had a gale, just took all the sails down and left her. Well, so Hayley swings round, beam on. Now that is not clever. You can't do that. You'll get rolled. And I realised, and the waves were hitting, it was sort of a percussive wave, it was like a, an anvil being swung at the hull. And you could hear this crack, and you think, Christ, she's not going to take this much longer. And recently, when I was refitting her, we discovered two broken frames, crack frames, which I've replaced. But I, they must have happened then. But, you know, she's so tough, it didn't, it didn't affect her. And it was then that I worked out, I've got to get the stern to this. I've got to swing around. One way or the other, bow to it or stern to it. If I go bow to, and she gets pushed back by these waves, I could lose the rudder. And I'd already broken the tiller, so that was on a jury tiller. I, don't, I can't risk that. I've got to put a stern to it. And I think it was easier to put the stern to anyway. And my last purchase before I left, £17, I bought to 720 feet of two-inch polypropylene best investment I ever made. So I got that out and I streamed it in a great big bite from the boat in a bite and back on board the boat. And she just swung stone two, just stone two, and she just lay there. I thought, fantastic. I've got it how I want her. And now the waves were breaking with that canoe stern she's got. The waves were breaking, but they weren't slamming her. Um, she'd surge forward when, when the wave, you know, the big waves are coming along and if they're breaking, they're nasty. But she'd surge forward, but then she'd check. There was enough give to avoid the slam, but enough braking power to stop her rushing down the front and broaching in front of the wave. Because this recent Golden Globe race, I mean, five boats dismasted down there. And I did a little report on that because I studied it. I said, this is a common factor. And it was. They weren't holding the boat. They were letting her run. And that's, it's not the way to do it. You've got to check the boat. So I learned that. My first really big storm down there, and you know, I had to do something. I, we couldn't have gone on like that. And that's what came to mind. I'd probably read it somewhere, some, heard about someone using warps, and it stuck in my mind. Boy, it worked. Thank goodness. I remember interviewing um, Michelle Dishwire, you know, the yeah. professor of, of ocean yeah. racing, you know, about how what's the way to prepare, I guess, for an ocean race, and he said. In your mind, you have to accept that something will go wrong every day. And if you, st if you start the race <laughs> knowing that and you train for that, then it's a lot easier. And when I hear you list, Robin, all the things that happened, I mean, did it feel like that every day there was something to deal with? Yeah, you know, in gooseneck breaking, you know, spending two days with a hand drill, cutting a one-inch diameter hole to replace it through... <laughs> Steel, half an inch thick. Um, but I'm, I'm with Mish on this, actually. Um, I think he's absolutely right. And if you go with that with attitude when you start out, um, you're not so... Morale isn't damaged when something does go wrong. You know, you just say, oh, it's that's today. You know, bastard. Right, I've got to fix this now. You know, what else am I going to do? Oh, I better put some stitches in that sail before it rips further. You know, there's always something to do, isn't there, around a boat? How often do you do a shackle check? I don't know, I used to do the morning and evening. Um, do you uncheck the boat in the morning and check in the evening before it got dark? Go around, check all the shackles tight, everything holding, you know, just do an inspection. It's, it's for your own good, you know, you're looking after yourself. I think the great joy of single handing actually is you've no one to be responsible for. Well, you made it to New Zealand and your friend and colleague Bruce Maxwell was waiting there for you in a boat. I mean, how tempting was it at that point to call it a day with all the damage to the self-steering, the radio, your water supply problems? You know, there you were chatting to your mate, presumably only an hour or so away from a beer, a steak and some warm, dry clothes. I had no intention of pulling in. Um... My brothers just sent me, found amongst my mother's paper, the letter I threw to the Melbourne pilot vessel. I wrote to sent letters home. And there's my letter. 
and I, I got it two days ago. I'm just reading through. And there's the list of things I wanted to bring down to Falmouth when I get back. You know, I'm not pulling in, I'm carrying on. Uh, from Melbourne, they, I suddenly appeared off Melbourne, and of course the news got back. Okay, he's still alive. What's his plans? Um, heading towards New Zealand. Okay, carrying on. Got various little messages. And Kiwis were great, really, because they realised I couldn't transmit, but they'd send me the messages anyway. So I'd tune in and they'd send the message in the hope that I was listening, which I was, which was absolutely brilliant. That's how I got news of the storm, which I took me around the bottom of New Zealand. Um, but it, it was great. Then I met Bruce, and of course we had this absolute nonsense. He brought my mail out. The Sunday Times decided if he gave me the mail, it was my mail, it was outside assistance. Ah, oh, come on, get a life, guys. So he had to open my letters sitting on a boat about five metres away and read the contents to me. <laughs> So, there we were. Anyway, that's but, quite um, a moment. Once I floated off, um, off I went. You know, I was going on, and by that time, anyway, um, water wasn't so much of a problem. I was catching plenty in the sails. I'd got a pretty good idea I could balance her, uh, so I didn't need the self steering, which I didn't have anyway. That had gone. Um, I was fairly confident I could deal with that. The main boom was back up to strength. Um, I had sufficient food. I have a receiver. I don't have a transmitter, but I've got a receiver. I can get time signals. That's absolutely vital for navigation with the sextant. So I can get time signals. That's the important thing. Um, hey, you know, if I can see someone around Cape Horn, I'll let you know I've passed. But otherwise, allow me a couple of months and I'll go around. And uh, and that was it. You know, I, was, I wasn't pulling out. Let's talk about Sir Haley Robin. I've mentioned your book a couple of times. I find it so endearing that from beginning to end, you never refer to yourself. It's always we or us. And that's so telling. I think even at the beginning, you say the voyage is really Sir Haley's story. How pleased were you with her as the miles ticked by? I built up a huge affection for Sue Haley and a tremendous trust in her. She is simple. She's not complicated. I remember sailing round to Bristol in it with Spud Spedding. He said, the thing about Sue Haley is, she's really a little merchant ship, isn't she? I said, well, you shouldn't be surprised. She was built by a merchant navy officer. <laughs> Everything's stronger than it needs to be. Everything's thought through. It's, you know, you look at the rig on her. I didn't break a single piece of rigging going around the world. Um, a lot of it was hand spliced too. Uh, it's a lot of it's been trial and error over the years. Learning about sailing, you know, you need your lower shroud stronger than you think, uh, for instance. But she is really a little ship. She's tough. She's not complicated. I mean, okay, I've got a plotter on her these days. I've spoilt myself. But the only navigation instrument I've got is an echo sounder. You know, and that's it. You know, I, I look at the Windex. That tells me what the wind's doing. That's good enough. Feel it on my cheek. Yeah, time to take a reef. Or when well, I ought to put some sail up, really. And, you, know, you, you just know it, don't you? And I can still, not as good as I used to 50 years ago, but I can go out in the Solent and people say, what are you doing? I say, I'm just lashing the helm. All right, what's going to happen? I said, well, I want to go down and get my cigarettes. So I want the boat to sail herself. So I'm lashing the helm. Oh. When she go off course? Hopefully not. So I quite often do it just to see if I can still do it. <laughs> With everything we know now about design and materials, even the weather and forecasting, do you think the level of seamanship required to get a 32 foot teak yacht through the Southern Ocean back then is so much more than that required to charge around the planet in the 2020 and Walker 60s? I think it's a totally different game. Um, one, you're not going to be at sea for anything like so long. Uh, that's good because that cuts down the wear and tear. Uh, two, you've got all this information coming in, which means you can sail faster because you've got weather information. You've got instant communication if anything goes wrong. Uh, your sails, well, they're pre-shaped, aren't they? Um, you've got them, 
you shove them up and off you go. They're, they're going to probably last you around the world if you're all things being equal, as long as you care for them. Um, your food, freeze dried, you've got a water maker. But the disadvantage is, of course, you've probably got a sponsor you've got to look after, which means you've got to tune up your radio and talk to journalists all the time. And they ask you to call them up at a time which is extremely inconvenient, but you've got to do it for your sponsor. So that's what the modern sailor has to put up with. But I mean, actually, I mean, I've been over Alex's boat, his new one, which is an amazing machine. He doesn't need to go on deck, hardly. Quite an amazing machine, some clever ideas in it too. And I've seen it out foiling. I mean, wow, what a, what a show. But um, right, like last weekend, I watched, watched Ben foiling. Um, but it's a different game now. You don't need the skills, the sail-making skills we had then, stitching sails, learned in the Merchant Navy. Um, splicing wire, people can't do that now, not even riggers. Uh, splicing rope, most people can do that, different sort of rope these days. Uh, people are used to their rope not, they might chafe, but it won't break. Whereas in those days, man-made, we weren't man-made fibers. So using sisal or manila, and eventually it does, it will go. Um, I did have polypropylene, but didn't have the strength and reliability. Uh, just served my purpose. Uh, you know, blocks were pretty old fashioned. The winches, you look at them now and people say, what museum did you get that from? No, they were new. When I built this boat, I mean, they've been on the boat ever since about yes, and they still work. Right. And that shows you they were made, well made in the first place. Um, and everything's like that. It's, it's a different game. Well, Robin, you mentioned earlier that it, it wasn't just about, you know, being the first to circumnavigate. It was also a race and there was money on offer for the first boat back and not to mention of course, the historical significance. And 66 days into your voyage, you learned that one of the darlings of French sailing, Bernard Mortissier, had left Plymouth in the faster 40-foot steel catch, Joshua. Tell us what you knew of Mortissier at that time. Well, what I've been able to find out about Mortissier was he'd, he'd sailed the Southern Ocean before. He was one of the very few who'd done it. Um, so he had that experience. And that was useful. On the other hand, he was prepared to go back down there. So I looked at that as a positive. I thought, well, okay, this chap's been through it, but he's not terrified of it. Okay, so perhaps I don't need to be terrified of it. Um, my real concern was he got the faster boat, and he knew that boat very well. And it was going to be a question, could I keep sufficiently ahead of him? Um, would I be able to hang on to a, you know, a, a lead, which I got, and hope that, um, no, I didn't want him to get into trouble or difficulties, but hope that somehow I, I just managed to sail fast enough to get ahead of him. And that's really what my thinking was. So there was that pressure on me to keep the boat moving all the time. I found out where he was off New Zealand, and he was about four weeks behind me. Yeah, about that. So halfway round, he's more or less halved the gap. But he'd been slowing down. And in fact, he was, we found out later, three weeks behind me at Cape Horn. He had slowed down a lot. And apparently he met some fishermen off um, Tasmania and, and said, where was I? And they said, oh, I'd left. New Zealand four weeks before, and apparently it's finished. It's interesting, isn't it? I mean, did you have the feeling then that, you know, this race was on? I mean, did you feel more pressure? Yes, but against everyone. You know, uh, all right, off New Zealand, I discovered that most guys had pulled out. Um, I learned about Nigel Tetley uh, in his trime round, which I didn't think was suitable. Uh, but he made a tremendous voyage, actually, in the end. I heard about this chap, Crowhurst, I'd never heard of him. Um, King was out by then, Fougeron was out by then, Che was out, John was out, Caruzzo was out. So of the nine who started, there were only four of us left, of which three of us got into the Southern Ocean. Um, my admiration really was the Tetley, because a 40-foot trimaran, 
down in those seas. I thought that was a brilliant effort. And he so nearly made it. Such a shame. Inevitably, Robin, thoughts turn to home. But weather forced you away from the Falklands, so no radio contact was established until communications off the Azores with a mobile tanker, who relayed your position, news of your well-being even, and um, back home to London. At that point, how were you feeling after almost 300 days at sea, almost home, and letting your family know where you were? Well, the problem was, I didn't know that message had got through. Uh, so it was Easter Saturday, and it was about 7.20 in the evening. In fact, 20 to 9, my brother picked up the phone to be told. So the chap on the mobile at me got that message straight through to Lloyd's, who um, got through to home and told the papers. They actually stopped the Sunday Mirror. They stopped printing and changed the front page. Amazing. Must have cost a fortune. Um, but I had I listened in the next morning on the on the receiver to the BBC and there was no mention of it at all. So I just assumed well they haven't reported me. I think it was just the normal BBC not interested in saying anything really. Um, and I I'm not maligning them. I'm being frankly honest there. But um, so I didn't know for another at least a week when I ran into this French merchant ship and called him up and said, M-I-K, please report me to Lloyd's. And he, he came back and he said, there's Yacht Suheri reported missing. And he said, yes, you are missing. <laughs> what do you mean? So I asked him where Matessia was. And he said, in the Indian Ocean. I thought, absolutely not. No way. No way. But did he knew I was missing. He didn't know or didn't say that I'd been reported. So I still didn't know if... Um, if everyone at home knew where I was. I now knew that if he was accurate, there was no reason why I shouldn't. I was going to be first in. But I had no idea if there'd be anyone expecting me because you know, no one had heard from me. Um, of course, in fact, it was building up down there in Falmouth. And there were some very funny stories too about all that. Um, we'll, get, we'll get to Falmouth. Uh, we're not quite there yet. Um, I always, you did speak to your family though, didn't you? I mean, there's a story in the book that through a radio relay station, you know, it must have been so surreal. You know, as you were getting nearer to home, almost two weeks away, you know, talking from Suheili and the operator asked if he could put you through to anyone and dialed your mum's phone number. And there you are talking to your family after 300 days right. at sea. I've been fiddling with this radio for months and I'd found something that's corroded and I thought if I can solder that I might just get this thing working. I didn't have any solder so I, I mean my nav lights are gone so I melted the bottom of a nav light and used that as solder which worked. The trouble was it kept blowing the fuses. So I called up Baldock which was then the um, long range radio station in Britain before it moved to Portishead and I got through. Oh. It's good. Uh, anyone you'd like to talk to? And he was quite funny about it. Sue Haley, Sue Haley, is that you, Sue Haley? I mean, he was so sweet about it. Um, <coughs> and I said, yes, please, I'd like to go through to home. And he put me through. Um, I couldn't believe it. But it wasn't going to take lo long before the transmitter would blow and the fuse would go. And of course, people don't realise you've got a problem. So they think you've gone quiet for some other reason. Actually, I've gone quiet because the fuse has gone. And I ended up putting a nail in the fuse thing. I mean, I just wanted this damn thing to work. What did they, what did they think at home when the phone rang? And um, you... Well, I think they were a little bit surprised, to be honest, because uh, they thought the radio packed up. Well, it had. But I just fiddled with it. I thought I'd be, I'd like to make sure someone's waiting for me. So I have no engine. I'll sail into Falmouth. So I'll just have to anchor um, and sort of use an oldest to call up the signal station, which that I could do. It was my only means of, of communicating was Morse code. So um, I thought, well, that's what I'll have to do, go and anchor somewhere and wait for people to realise I'm back here. That's so funny. You're worried about someone being there to catch your ropes. And actually, there was massive excitement, wasn't there, as you neared Farmer? Planes, helicopters, motor yachts with family and journalists. 
And here you are cocooned and alone for over 300 days facing this mass of celebrations. What do you remember of your arrival? Well, the first thing was um, I'd rounded the lizard and was coming up towards Falmouth. And they said, what time will you cross the finish line? I said, about nine. They said, ah, um, do you mind showing up? I said, oh, come on. Been at sea for 312 days. I want a pint, a steak and a bath in that order. Why do you want me to up? Well, the mayor and mayor is going to greet you and the mayor is getting a hair done. So, and it's a nine o'clock appointment. So if you could just slow up an hour or so, that was it. Okay, I'll slow up a bit. So I slowed up a bit. The wind then changed, uh, went round to the northwest. So now we're beating. Suhadi doesn't like beating. So it wasn't until 3.25 in the afternoon that I eventually crossed the finish line, by which time my poor, poor dear's hairstyle was pretty damaged. Um, but, you know, I was just trying to get myself across that finish line. BBC boat managed to hit me. Thought you had a, a bleep on it because I told them what I thought of them. Uh, Chichester was extremely embarrassed. He was on board. <laughs> Nothing to do with him. It's the first time we met. And... Um, so, you know, eventually across the line. What people don't get, I said, all right, what's happening now? Oh, I said, I said where's my boat going? Oh, no, no, no. where's my boat going? Where was she going to tie up? You know, I'm worrying about my boat. Perfectly natural for a sailor. Of course, all these people rushing, wow, you know, press, press, press here, press here. Where's my boat going? For Christ's sake, give me an answer. Well, we'll take you in tow. Good. Right, do you want a tow line or shall I provide one? No, we'll have a tow line. Fine, that's okay. But where is she going? And we've got a, a mooring for it. Right. Okay, now you've answered my question. Thank you. Now I can relax. <laughs> Robin, you've done the most incredible thing and you're all grumpy about parking the boat. Well, of course I'm not grumpy. I'm worried. <laughs> what was the scale of, of, of that day? You know, I, I remember, you know, when Ellen came back, breaking... Um, breaking the record around the planet, and Falmouth was just crazy. I mean, what was that like 50 years ago there? Pretty crazy. Um, there weren't anything like as many yachts in those days, but a lot came out, and you could see all around Pendennis, um, it was black with people. And you think, what's this? You think, What's going on? Some sort of party or something. And then you realize, it's us. <laughs> you know? Oh, well, this is rather nice. Uh, yeah, but what happens when I get ashore? Uh, yeah, what happens when I get ashore? Oh, well, let's just get in there and find out. That's all you can do. How did you celebrate? Well, um, I got my pint of beer. I got my steak. I got the bath. And then the party started. So I went to bed at five the following morning, by which time most people had either collapsed or gone to bed. We did the same the next night, and of course I'm, I'm fine. I'm used to funny hours. But then I began to realise actually I needed to get a bit more sleep. And um, then there was, you know, making plans to bring her around to London. Um, so, you know, starting to deal with that. I think the worst part of it was, because I had no agent or anything. I had a literary agent, but I had, I had no PR team or anything. I had just family and friends. Um, none of the thing you get these days. And people kept coming up and saying, will you come and open our fate? Will you do this? Will you do that? I said, I can't make any plans at the moment. You know, but you're, you're feeling friendly. You know, I haven't talked to people for so long. And you keep sort of just stopping yourself agreeing to do something. Because then it's a pressure on you. And I don't need, I've got a book to write. You know, that's my contract. I need to write that book. And so that was filling me, you know, get that book written. Then I'll take a breath and we'll see what I do next. But right now I need to, get the boat round to London, get her sorted out, get her somewhere safe, and then sort the book out and get the book written. Were you surprised about how gripped the, the nation was with, with what you'd been up to? I suppose I was a bit, yes. Uh, it all seemed a bit unreal, to be honest with you. But I suppose because I'd been missing for some five months, um, you know, I sort of reappeared. Um, I suppose that made it a a better story in a way for the for the media. Where have you been? Well, I've been sailing actually. <laughs> well, Robin, while you were halfway around the planet around the Christmas time, 
Jim Lovell and the crew on board Apollo 8 became the first three men to return from a flight around the moon. Uh, and obviously, four months after your journey ended, Neil Armstrong did eventually then, rather famously, walk on the moon itself. Both massive achievements in a very new field. But man had been sailing for centuries. Why do you think a solo lap of the planet took as long to achieve as landing on the moon? And where do you think your achievement sits in man's great feats of exploration? I think um, pleasure sailing. I mean, a, a Cornish fishing boat mystery, wasn't it? Sailed from Cornwall to Australia. All right, they pulled into Cape Town. But um, so long voyages had been made. Um, but in yachting, if you think about it, there were some transatlantic achievements in the 1800s. Slocum went round the world, stopping off, obviously, sensibly. I think people just thought that's just a bit too far. And it wasn't really until Chichester went and said, well, actually, I think we can get a yacht round the world, uh, single-handed, and bring it back um, with just one stop. And I think that sort of opened the gates. Up to then, the longest voyage really had been transatlantic. And so suddenly people were saying, oh, wait a minute. Wow. Is it possible? And I think a few of us thought it was. Um, Chester certainly did. Rose certainly did. But I think others as well looked at it and said, actually, I think this is possible. I think we've reached the stage now with the equipment we've got for our time, which we can do it. And I think that's probably... Would you have got round with cotton sales? Uh, probably not, for example. You know, there's all these things. We did have um, Dacron by then, and that did make a difference. Um, and I think materials had improved a bit, you know, rope, etc. Clothing, not really, but you just got used to being wet. But I think that's that was it. We just reached the point where actually, one, we were capable of doing it, we weren't certain we were capable, we thought we might be. And two, the time had come. And it just happened to coincide with Lovell and Co going round the moon. And I picked that up on my receiver from some station in the Caribbean. I was waiting for a time signal. I thought, wow, that's fantastic. And of course, after I got back to the great landing on the moon, I, th I thought that was phenomenal. You haven't answered the, the sort of tough bit of the question. I mean, where do you think your achievement sits in man's great feats of exploration? Well, I think if you went to most media in this country, they'd probably say, who is he? So I don't think it registers. It does amongst sailors, obviously, and probably more in other countries than here, actually. Um, and whenever I go to France, I get a tremendous reception. I get treated very well. Um, and the States, pretty good. Oz, New Zealand, yep. But I think in a way here, you know, you say, well, what's he do? Did he manage a football club? No, no, he sailed around the world. Oh, one of them, no. Mm. Yeah, next, let's, let's hear what Liverpool have done. Oh, they won the cup, right, that's great. And it's all about that, isn't it? Sailing, although it's a huge sport in this country, gets very little coverage. And uh, I think it's a great shame because it's a great, healthy, outdoor sport. And we're rather good at it in this country. And uh, I think it's a shame we just don't get... Sailing, sailing as a sport in this country can support itself, really. It can manage without the media. It does manage without the media. Would football manage without the media? Probably fairly well, but not the same way. It needs the money. We seem to manage without the media, because tell me where we get any coverage, especially here. Get it in France. That's Not a whole here. other podcast, Robin. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, get, we'll get to that some other time. <laughs> I mean, there is a, a slightly sinister postscript to the Golden Globe, isn't there? Obviously, you know, Tetley hung himself afterwards, mm. and, and the tragic story, of course, of Donald Crowhurst. What were your thoughts about Crowhurst when the details of his story were revealed? I mean, it was massive news, wasn't it? Mm. Yes, it was. Yeah, because it's, uh, it's um, 
sort of news papers as well, you know, oh dear, bad news, love it. Um, I was one of the 12 who knew the truth, um, and we were keeping it very tight. But the Sunday Times, when they first heard the story, before the facts came through, I thought, you know, you've just fallen off. What a tragedy. And that's what the world outside thought. Then his logbooks were sent back by the Picardy, the ship that found him. And it was, oh, crikey. Now, the Sunday Times already started an appeal and realised that Actually, the reason for this appeal now, you know, was everyone's sympathetic. Poor chap's fallen off his boat. Well, wait a minute, this story isn't quite so nice. And Lord Goodman, Sunday Times wanted to just cancel the appeal, and Lord Goodman said, well, you can't do that. You've raised this money legally. It's got to be used for what it was raised for, or you've got to give it back to everyone who's donated. Well, that was too big a job. So... Um, decision was made to carry on with the appeal and I, I put the prize money in. Um, and that saved the Crowhurst family from being thrown out of the house. Um, so it was worthwhile. Um, I mean, Robin, for those of our listeners who, who don't know the incredible story and, you know, filmic as it proved to be, just perhaps, you know, detail what happened to, to Donald. Well, Donald Crowhurst was not an experienced sailor. He got a failing electronics business, making equipment for yachts, direction finders. And he thought this was going to be a way for him to establish his company and uh, get some money back. He got a sponsor in a local businessman down in Timworth. But the deal was that if it didn't work out, he didn't achieve it, he'd got to pay it back. That meant selling his house. His boat wasn't ready in time. He sailed, nevertheless, 31st of October, as per the rules. He was still in an awful mess. And I think he very quickly realised his boat wasn't suitable. It wasn't that well built. Um, and he began, frankly, to panic. Because he was faced with the fact, if I turn around and go back, I lose my house. I'm a failure. It won't help. And he fell, you know, that siren call, you could lie. And so he started making up his positions and sending them back. Now, we know this because he kept two old books. He kept the real one, which was honest, and he kept the false one, which were found on the boat after he died. And it's, it's almost as if he was sort of torn. Well, he never left the Atlantic, but he was sending his messages back, you know, indicating he was going to places. Chichester was very suspicious of him right from the beginning. And the chap who was doing all the navigation checking for Chichester was, was the one who alerted Chichester to it. He said, this isn't right. What's he doing? Breaking the world speed record in the doldrums. It doesn't work out. The weather there at this moment is this. He was a master man. So Chichester was suspicious. Then he caught Bulldog out because Crowhurst sent a message, I think, from between South Africa. He claimed it was in South Africa and Australia. And Chichester asked Bulldog which arrow that came in. And it it wasn't the one pointing there, it was the one pointing to South America. And Chichester knew that. And so he became very suspicious. And of course, actually, that was true. Crowhurst had never left. He was heading towards Argentina, where he stopped and went ashore, uh, thereby disqualifying himself anyway. Hung around for a bit and then left. No one in Argentina reported him. So no one knew anything about him. So now he's starting to invent rapid progress up the... Um, Atlantic, working on the basis that he wants to do a good time to get lots of publicity, but actually wants Tetley to get back in in front of him so he hasn't won a prize and therefore won't be examined, although Chichester was going to examine him. But of course, he, that forced Tetley to push, and Tetley pushed too hard and his boat broke up. Well, now he's faced with, bloody hell, when I get in, they're going to check up on me. Now, it'd be all right for a navigator like me. I could probably fiddle a logbook like that, uh, and you, you wouldn't get me, but he is not a navigator. And if you just go through all his calculations, which is all we had in those days, you'll, pick, you'll find the fault eventually. It's going to turn out and say, wait a minute, that's not right. And that was going to happen. And he suddenly realised he would be exposed as a fraud. And I think he just couldn't take it psychologically. So eventually... 
wrote some very peculiar things in his logbook, picked up his clock and jumped overside. Absolutely tragic story. Four children, eldest was 12. Imagine going to school and people thinking, oh, your daddy killed himself. Awful. Um, which is why, actually, I wanted to keep quiet. So, you know, so that this, people don't have to know the truth. Well, it was too good a story, wasn't it? Media weren't going to let that go. The story of Donald Crowhurst is indeed a tragic one, played out in that groundbreaking Golden Globe race of 1968-69. The Golden Globe must be one of the most documented stories in our sport. And if you're not familiar with it, I do urge you to get a hold of the excellent Peter Nichols book, A Voyage for Mad Men. As far as sailing books go, it's right up there. It's been read multiple times in our household and is a very thorough telling of the race story. More specifically, Crowhurst's story was recently dramatised in the 2017 Colin Firth film, The Mercy, if you've not seen that. But I would also recommend a wonderful documentary from 2006. It's called Deep Water, made by documentary heavy hitters Darlow Smithson, using lots of original recordings and wonderful onboard film footage from the race. It's around online and very definitely worth watching. And of course, for the real inside story on Robin's voyage, give his book a read, it's fascinating. A World of My Own, another all time great sailing book. Well, there is much to enjoy from Robin in part two. It's already available online and has much more chat from Robin as we discuss his Jules Verne trophy attempts with the legendary Sir Peter Blake. His Amoka 60 campaign around the world while in his 60s and of course, the Clipper race, his open to all crude around the world racing experience. As ever, please let me know what you think about the podcast at Shirley Sale on Instagram and Twitter and just me on Facebook. And please try to like, review and subscribe on whatever platform you're joining us on. It would be great to know your thoughts on Sir Robin and to know how you've enjoyed any of the other podcasts we've been making. While you're online and on my social media channels, take a look at the video we posted to promote the podcast. As Robin talks about his love for his boat Suheli, which he still sails. And while you're watching it, just remember that he lived on her without pause for over 300 days in the toughest sailing waters on the planet. It really puts his achievement into perspective. As ever, this podcast has been brought to you by the dedication of our wonderful producer, Tim, at Vertigo Films. Big thanks as ever to Tim, you're a star. Until next time, thank you so much for listening and sail safe, everyone. This is Castle Washington, race officer speaking. Master coming here, Texas coming. We're 1.5 below. Two guys here, boys. We're looking at 10.5 and 42. This is Castle One standing by. Out.